Welcome to another episode of Dr. Simone Says. My name is Simone Eastman Yuan. I am a medical doctor with sickle cell disorder. I am also the best-selling author of the books All Rise, The Sickle Cell Community versus the Medical Establishment, and A Doctor in a Patient's Body, Dreaming Big with Sickle Cell Disease and Chronic Pain. These days, I like to spend my time making sure that every sickle cell survivor becomes a sickle cell thriver because it matters that we live well. Hello, everyone. I am so excited, you guys. So this is Dr. Simone here. And I decided to bring my sister who blew into town for 24 hours. Um, and um, at least we have her for 24 hours. She's here in other um, uh, business. but um, And so I thought it'd be a great idea to talk about what it is like um, living with uh, a sibling with sickle cell disease. I know that oftentimes, you know, we talk about things that have to do with the person themselves and what their experience is like. But the thing about sickle cell disease is that it really does affect everybody. Just like it takes a village to raise a child, it, it's, it affects the village raising that child as well. And so um, I have an incredible support system, but it has definitely, you know, impacted um, both positively and negatively. It's impacted um, the lives of the people around me. And so um, with my one sister where we grew up like two peas in a pod we would fight and make back up in the same hour <laughs> um she probably knows <laughs> the most about me um and uh and can tell you a lot of things um about about that life and so um oh i was going to also ask you what you thought about Anakin. i totally forgot that question anyway we can ask that question at the end too. Um, but um, without um, holding holding us back, let me jump into the question. So we I, we kind of sat here and I made some questions up, and um, she's going to answer. But we didn't discuss the answers uh, for transparency and authenticity sake. So um, our first uh, well, let me have her first introduce herself. So, hi, I am Clyde Eastman, Dr. Simone Yuan's little sister. Um, and it is uh, my privilege to be able to share um, with, you know, all of you who have, uh, might have siblings um, that are dealing with sickle cell mm -hmm. and uh, just to kind of give you a perspective on, um, you know what that is like from my perspective, my point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So my first question is, how was it like growing up with a sister who was frequently sick? Um, so, as you mentioned um, before, it was the two of us, you know, always sick as thieves, and so. When you would get ill, it was very lonely. Mm. Um, because I lost my best friend. I didn't have anyone to play with. And um, sometimes I was a little like, you know, shoot, I wish you'd get, red, get better already. So I would can... not have even thought about that. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, from, yeah. a, from a child's from perspective, a child. yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. okay, you know, I don't have anyone to play with. I don't have anyone to chase me around or climb trees with or, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, you know, I would I always knew you would you would get better because it, it you know it became such a norm after a while, you know, that it was like, okay, well, I just have to bide my time and wait for her to go through her process and, and, and get well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it certainly wasn't fun watching you um be sick because that also, you know, as a child you feel kind of helpless, but you don't really process it from that deep of a level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you lost your buddy. I lost my buddy. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, so my second question to my sister is, was there ever a time when you were scared for my life? Uh, yes. So 
like I said before, growing up with the frequency of you getting ill, being down for a couple of days or a week or so, and then you'd be back up. Um, but I remember the one you had gotten, this was my real understanding of the first time that you had gotten like deathly ill. Um, and you went to the hospital and you were diagnosed with having pneumonia. Mm. And was this uh, in Guyana? This or? was in Guyana. Oh, yes, yeah. This was this okay. was in Guyana, and that um, that was that was really really scary um, because there was a moment there where I wasn't sure if I was going to get you back. You know, um, I was used to the um, you, you know just a few weeks would pass or time would you know go by and then we'd be back playing and mm. we'd be back doing what we do. Um, when you went into the hospital and you were so frail, and I remember looking at you and seeing a shell of you and not you, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I lost a lot of weight. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was, I, I thought I was losing, I thought I was losing my body for real. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't think you were going to come back, but you did. But you did. You did. And look, I'm all chunky I too. Look. <laughs> I clearly gained the weight back. Wow. Uh, um, yeah. Wow. Some things I you we don't prepare for. <laughs> um. Okay. Um. I was like twelve. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Gosh, I, that was that was scary. Uh, the the hardest part is just watching how you, you know you literally withered away. And you know, yeah, that was that was tough. Um, what do you think the overall impact has been on the family? Um, I, I think that's an interesting question, right? Because if you're talking about the broader scope of our family, I think there's some who still are not quite connected to the reality mm -hmm. of what you experience. Yeah. Um, the immediate family, however, I think um, I, I think the the impact has been one of of helplessness of trying to uh, take this um, disease on a day by day basis because you can't you can't run but so far ahead because you don't know what's really coming. Um, it, it's not something you can plan for really. You mm -hmm. just have to do that day by day process. Yeah. Um, so I think it's it's just that level of uncertainty and you know angst of you know we made it through today are we gonna have a good day tomorrow as well are mm -hmm. we gonna have a good day the following is this gonna be a good week you know can we even dare to see a month out mm -hmm. you know can we plan something can we plan something right? yeah that, I that used level to of hate that yeah. Yeah. People would ask, oh, are you guys going to be able to come to whatever? Yeah. And we love going to whatever. Right. <laughs> it's just, it's just, uh, I have to get back to you on that. <laughs> and the sad thing about it is up until this point, yeah. I was not diagnosed. Right. So we didn't know what I had. We mm -hmm. just knew that I was just always sickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wasn't diagnosed until I was 19 years old. And um, and so the whole time, you know, we could we had nothing to even tell our friends like, mm -hmm. um, OK, she didn't make your party because, mm -hmm. you know, so sometimes people, you know, could get offended and think oh, she just didn't want to come to our party or yeah. she just didn't want to come hang out with us. But mm -hmm. they had no idea, you know, what we were dealing with at home. And mm -hmm. then, you know, my sister would be having to, like, you know, explain that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's um, it, yeah. Um, so, um, can you talk about a time when something medical was happening, um, with me and we talked about it and how you felt about it? And we haven't talked about this stuff. So, um, these questions or the answers. So, so there's a couple of, of, um, situations. Um, I know, let me see here. I think. Um, there, there's a couple. So the one I will speak to, uh, which I think was most impactful for me, uh, was the hip replacement. Um, 
because I felt like uh, there were so many missteps. Now, let me just be completely clear and transparent. I am not a medical professional. I do not understand half of the terms my sister uses, but she is very patient in, in you know, explaining things out to me. And I, I do have a medical community around me that I can tap into if additional clarity is needed. Um, but there were so many areas of opportunities to, to, to put it as kindly as I possibly can um, for the physicians that were caring for her. And um, I, was, I was very upset because I feel on a daily basis, um, Simone is always dealing with so much, you know, she gets up and she faces the world and, you know, she doesn't complain. And you, you know, most times if you're talking to her on the phone or, you, you know, she would be encouraging you. And I just felt, you know, why would you not put everything in to make sure you get it right the first time um, and take away even one good day from her, you know? So I, I was very upset about that. And then I also was, felt very helpless because we don't live very close to each other. So it's not a situation where I can run to the hospital mm -hmm. and advocate um, on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, I know and again, uh, Simone's husband does a fantastic job of advocating on her behalf. But, you know, when you're, when you're at a distance and you hear these stories, um, you want to pitch in. You want to be able to jump in there and say, hey, no, this is, not, this is not a number on a chart. This is my sister. You know, I need you to be focused. I need you to pay attention. I need this to be as important to you as it is to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> this one. You know, we when we moved from um, Guyana, South America, we moved to um, New York because that's where the rest of our family was. So that was like, you know, the natural place to be. But New York was not nice uh, for my sickle cell disease at all. And so um, actually with the help of my church, they found, um, uh, they said, you know, you, you got to get out one year. Um, I had a friend who had sickle cell also. We both went into the hospital, and to make a long story short, I made it out, and she didn't, and I suffered so much survivor guilt over that. But after that, you know, I think that everybody got a clear picture of what it could do because she was 20. Um, and so, um, so I basically got lifted from my base from my family and sent to California because it was warmer and because we found a family that could host me. Um, it was either fl Florida or California and it just happened that California opened up at the time. So I ended up being in California and um, pretty much finishing out my schooling there and going to medical school um, in, um, in Northern California, which I didn't realize was also cold, but that's another story. It wasn't as cold as New York, but I had to get out of there eventually. Um, but that's what she's talking about in terms of um, her sense. being far away yeah. is that, you know, everybody got left in New York while, you know, there, everyone was trying to save me by sending me away from New York. But, you know, people were working, going to school, had, ho you know, homes. So it wasn't like they could just, you know, just drop yeah. uh, all of that to move, you know, with me. So they were constantly on the phone with me when I was sick uh, in the hospital, you know, trying to make sure that I was okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I could imagine, I could only imagine how, you know, I mean, I'm in the middle of it and I'm trying to just live, yeah. but, you know, um, I could only imagine how frustrating it must be for watching a loved one, um, because I know that with, with my husband, and maybe you could talk about him now, actually, um, and what you know of him, what you think, yeah, be honest. So, there's always... Annie Ken. <laughs> He's a character. A.K.A. Annie, <laughs> A.K.A. the Grand Poobah. <laughs> I 
Grand Poobah. The Grand Poobah. He's had that name for years from her. The Grand Poobah. Um, <laughs> is probably the gentlest soul um, that you would ever have That's the privilege of, of meeting. And um, when Simone moved uh, away, that was one of the things that I, I worried about. I know she had a good host family and all of that, but um, I felt like I wasn't there because prior to her moving, you know, we spent a lot of time together when she was in school and I would go to her dorm and make sure she was okay and, you know, yes. just help her through whatever I could, whatever little I could do. Mm -hmm. um, when she moved, I, I no longer had that ability to do so. Um, and that was something that, that worried me, it haunted me. Um, and so, you know, I just prayed that she would end up in loving and supportive hands. And she did, you know. Um, Anakin, I, I cannot imagine a more wonderful caregiver, you know, his, his selfless capacity um, of putting others before himself and, and always making sure um, that, you know, my sister is, is well cared for. Um, has everything she needs. Um, it, 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 if you're if you're gonna do this, if, if you have this life, and you have a sibling um, with sickle cell, you watch them go through many phases. Mm -hmm. um, and in your own way, you're going through it with them. Uh, if you're like me you don't always vocalize because it's it's not about me it's about my sister who has the sickle cell illness um and so in your mind in your heart in your spirit you're always wanting a better day for them you know because you know that those are sometimes very infrequent so um I say all that to say that I, I don't have that concern anymore about her being in good hands. I don't have that concern. I, I still worry about, you know, her getting sick and going to the hospital and all those aspects of it, which is a continuation of the process of mm -hmm. living with, you know, living with sickle cell. Can you tell she's like um, a little big sister. <laughs> She's supposed to be younger. <laughs> we're, we're two years and eight months apart. Yes. So she's two years and eight months younger. But I think once, I think, gosh, it, it seems like it's, it's always been that way where, yeah. you know, once I, you know, got it, you know, sick often enough, she was just like, mama bear you know and i could go back to being the big sister when i was you know stable yeah. and standing on two feet but you know um but the the minute that i i needed something you know and i i wrote about that in my my book um um uh about you know just her coming uh to the dorms and like yanking me out the bed and you know saying you smell go take a shower <laughs> because i, I had a single I cell it quite that so, way. <laughs> it was just the two of us so you could tell me anything <laughs> at that point but um but, but throw me in the shower and while i was in the shower she would change my bed and go down the hall and do laundry and you know um so you know, I, I look at that and I think, wow, you know, it, it really does have an impact on the people around you because, you know, there's so many people trying to keep your arms up, mm -hmm. to, so many people trying to help you stay standing. And, um, and you know, I, I, for one, don't want to forget those people. I can't forget those nice. people in my life. So, um, all right. So what advice? would you give other siblings out there living with their loved ones um, that, have, that have sickle cell disease? Um, 
Hmm. To the siblings, to the of, siblings. Those, yep. of yep. the person with sickle cell disease. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just to be real, um, I, I'm I'm going to give you some advice, and I'm going to be very transparent. This advice may work given the day and the experience that you're having. Um, I would say be patient. Um, don't waste time. Don't waste time because as Simone said, when she went into the hospital, she made it out, her friend didn't. And that easily could have been her. Um, you know, looking back, I, I, I think of times when we, you know, had our sibling rivalries and, you know, and um, now I look at it and I'm like, wow, that, that was time wasted. You know, I've had so many touch and go uh, situations with my sister that um, work through whatever it is, you know, because uh, tomorrow's promise to no one. So um, if you need to talk something out, pick up the phone, go to their house, talk it out, work it out, get it out. Um, understand that this is not something that is controlled um, or controllable rather by um, your sibling. And if they're having a bad day, you just have to be there and just be supportive the best way you can. Don't take it personal. You know, mm -hmm. don't don't take it personal um, because if they if they could answer the phone, they would answer the phone. If they could come to the event, they would come to the event. So um, understand that life moves at a different speed for someone with sickle cell, um, and just love them, love them. You know. Thank you. Yeah. Just love, love Thank them. you for loving me too. Of course, hello. All right, so if somebody's asking a question, do you notice a difference in care by the physicians from when she was not a physician to now when she is a physician? Um, here's the thing. Um, even when I became a physician, I didn't tell people I was a yeah. physician. I was so scared of them judging me. I was so scared of them um, like finding out where I worked and telling them that I had been to the hospital and that I needed like whopping doses of narcotic medication to get better. Um, and, you know, people have their um, prejudices about that. And so I didn't want people, sometimes people were understanding, sometimes people just weren't. And I wasn't willing to take that gamble. Yeah. So unfortunately, a lot of times um, they did not know um, that I was a physician and um, they just treated me like crap, like mm -hmm. just treated me like everybody else. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, um, there, but there were those times when I had incredible physicians too. And so I always um, try to talk about those because they are, um, they are fewer. And so, um, so um, when I could, when things went really awry, I would, um, at the end of my stay, when I was feeling better, I would, I would pull them aside and I would talk to them and I would tell them that I'm talking to them. I usually said this. I said, I have two choices for you. I can either report you or I can educate you. Which one would you prefer? And of course, nobody wants to be reported. So inevitably, we ended up in a conversation. Now, how they took the conversation, you know, varied. But for the most part, I'll say that they always kind of came out saying, well, I didn't know this or I didn't know that. Or that that was really helpful to, um, you know, to shed light on, um, to elucidate. And um, that uh, I feel educated by something so um so and i told them i said you know the next person behind me with sickle cell isn't going to have medical background isn't going to have a medical knowledge and so they're not going to be able to advocate for themselves in this way by explaining it to you in your medical language they're also not going to be able to explain because you're treating them at a time when they're most vulnerable and with whopping doses of mind-altering drugs so you can't really fight fairly 
when you're, you know, when you're in that much pain, when your systems are crashing, and when you're being treated by by drugs that are very sedating that can knock you out. So um, I think I did my best to try to, you know, to educate once I disclosed that I was um, a physician, but for the most part, um, I I just watched and observed you know, because I always kept thinking my mom can't go to the ER and say that she's a physician. My sister can't go to the ER and say they're a physician. And so I want to see the kind of care that they are going to get. Um, I want to see the care that everybody else gets, um, you know, but primarily it was honestly, primarily it was because I was afraid of letting them know who I was because I didn't want them going back to my job and making life difficult for me. Um, and so. I, I just want to say to add to that, that is something that I've feedback I've gotten from so many patients with chronic illnesses um, is always that fear of my job is going to find out and how it's going to, how are they going to look at me? How is it going to affect my ability to grow within the, the organization? You know, um, so I mean that's that's a normal um, that's a normal feeling. Uh, personally, uh, if I'm being authentic, I wish you would have told them up front. <laughs> you know, that's just me. <laughs> and I always start like I don't understand why you're not telling them. You know, um, but you know, that's just me. <laughs> and again, this is from a sibling perspective. <laughs> tell them, <laughs> like you, tell know, them what what you're you're about. you know what you're talking about. Tell them what to do. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's what my family was always saying. <laughs> They'd be so mad. Like, you're having a discussion yeah. with them? Yeah. Like, <laughs> report them. <laughs> well, that's how, that's, I think when you're far away. It's, it's the defense can, mechanism. It's like, okay, I'm not there to fight the fight, you know, so how can I <laughs> fight it through you? <laughs> so. <laughs> so. Sue them all. <laughs> Report them all. Um, and, you know, a lot of them did, you know, things that were reportable, yeah. unfortunately. Um, but, you know, when you're that sick, um, you're, you're, you're using your energy for, you know, for yourself just to yeah. survive, just to make it through. So you're not, and that's why people get away with things is because you often are, just with enough energy just to make it through so right yeah. i remember us talking to you about one time you were saying that um the community of, of doctors that um treat you is so small that you didn't want to you know them to feel afraid of if they did anything or said anything that you know mm -hmm. so it, it would put at risk your chances of getting the treatment when you needed the treatment. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, okay, I'm gonna take what you give me because if I if I make too much noise, then I yes. might not get anything at all. Yeah. Um, which yep. was another thing that made me, you know, very upset. Um, and uh, you know, it, it. And that's another thing, like I was saying, as a sibling, you know, you go through these things and you're trying to process them. You don't have the illness, and a lot of it doesn't always make sense to you. Um, and you know, you, you're you're doing the best you can. Like, okay, no, please, you know, this is this is what needs to be done. Um, but you gotta have. Sometimes you have to just pray and surrender to the process of okay, this this is the industry. Unfortunately, you know, I watched my sister going to the hospital and you know, in, in a crisis and they want to send her home, you know, and, and you know, to, to have to worry about, okay, you, you did something wrong, but I can't say anything because then you're going to go tell, you know, Dr. Smith and Dr. Jones. And then, you know, when I need Dr. Smith and Dr. Jones, they're going to go, well, she's the tattletale, you know? So it's like all these different things you think about, and like, okay, I don't understand that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Um... You count the cost. Yes, yes. You, you count, count the, the cost, cost yes. of frequently. Yeah, of frequently. reporting, and and, um, and then what type do each of you have? Um, are you talking about like if she has a trait? I have. Um, I don't know what 
I'm not sure what she's asking. Uh, if you're referring to sickle cell, to sickle cell disease, I don't. Yeah, so she's, um, she's actually um, AA, so she doesn't have the trait or anything, so, so that's good. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that's what she's asking, but just in case. Um, and then um, for me, I have SC, um, hemoglobin SC, and um, I was told from very onset uh, to tell people that I present as SS because I tend to have lots of bone infarcts and lung infarcts and, you know, um, a vascular necrosis of, you know, various joints and things like that. But I have since met other people with hemoglobin SC that, so it's a range. So, you know, I, I, I realize that we typecast ourselves. It's like asking what type of cancer do you have? <laughs> you know, like, and saying, okay, well, you have breast cancer, so you're not as bad as the person with, you know, cancer. yeah, like it's, yeah. you know, after a while, they're, they're all bad. So, um, you know, um, so yeah, so I've, I've, I've realized that I don't have to say I present as SS because there's SC with a wide range of presentations and there's SS with a wide range of pre presentations. I've seen, you know, people with SS that have done uh, better than me and I've seen people with SS that have done worse than me. And so it's a wide range um, for both. I actually did um, a, a video on that, um, on the different types of, um, of, of sickle cell disease. And so you could check it out at um, my YouTube channel, Dr. Simone Says. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, you know, just shedding light on all of that. Um, all right, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you guys so much um, for uh, coming in and making it a community. Um, and, um, and I want to thank my sister. Not every part of my family likes coming on camera uh, to talk about things. And I totally respect that because, you know, just because I decided to step in, you know, into the camera for advocacy um, doesn't mean that, you know, <laughs> my whole family is going to have to be thrown out there too. So, um, but I do appreciate my, uh, my sister coming um, and um, talking about what it's like to be a sibling and the impact on the family. All right, you guys, have a good one. Bye. All right. Until next time, this is Dr. Simone Says, and remember, you are a sickle cell thriver and not just a survivor. If you benefited from this episode any at all, please like on the video, subscribe to the channel, and share the video with one other person as your good deed towards the sickle cell cause. Have a great day like to contact me to speak in your area, please don't hesitate to email me at drsimonesays at gmail.com. If you are the one referring me, please let me know so that I could send you a nice thank you surprise.